It's so good to see you. Um, I had the privilege of visiting uh, Bird Polar maybe a couple of weeks ago and um, immediately um, just fell in love with the place. And so thank you so much for what you do. Thank you so much for the students and trainees in the room. Um, really, um, really wonderful to see you. And I really am just here to introduce the speaker. And um, I, can't, I can't tell you how delighted I am that we are um, focusing on issues of climate justice. And um, you know, what the research that we do, the, um, the discovery, the teaching, all of that is so important, but ultimately um, it, is the, it is the impact on um, communities, people, um, the planet. And um, we have a speaker who is really committing her life's work uh, to issues of climate justice. So, so excited to have you here. Um, but I also get to read a, an amazing uh, story and, um, and biography. So um, really wonderful to welcome you, uh, Jacqueline Patterson. Um, and Ms. Patterson is the founder and executive director of the Chisholm Legacy Project, a resource hub for black frontline climate justice leadership. The mission of the Chisholm Legacy Project is rooted in a just transition framework and serves as a vehicle to connect Black communities on the front lines of climate justice with the resources to actualize visions. And so prior to this, um, Ms. Patterson served as the Senior Director of the NAACP Environmental and Climate Justice Program um, and did that work for over a decade. And during that time, she founded and implemented a robust portfolio that included serving the state and local leadership, whose constituencies consisted of hundreds of communities on the front line of environmental justice. The, um, she also led a team in designing and implementing a portfolio to support political education and organizing work executed by the NAACP branches, chapters, and state conferences. And since 2007, Ms. Patterson has dedicated her career to intersectional approaches to systems change. The social, this passion for social justice led her to become so many things, coordinator and co-founder of Women of Color United, senior women's rights policy analyst for ActionAid, assistant vice president of HIV AIDS programs for IMA World Health, outreach project associate for the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, research coordinator for Johns Hopkins University and a US Peace Corps volunteer in Jamaica. Jackie Patterson has published multiple articles, reports and toolkits, including equity and resilience, building for climate adapt adaptation and indicators document, jobs versus health and a necessary dilemma. Climate change is a civil rights issue, Gulf oil drilling disaster, gendered layers of impact, and disastrous climate change uproot women of colors. She has authored chapters in two books, and um, she also holds a master's degree in social work from the University of Maryland and a degree in public health from Johns Hopkins University. A little bit more. <laughs> the, uh, the accolades are incredible. She serves as ad on advisory boards for Center for Earth Ethics and the High Fund for Gender and Climate Justice on the Governance Assemblies for Mosaic Monument. Momentum Environmental Justice Movement Fellowship, the Movement Strategy Center, the Just Solutions Collectives, and the National Black Women's Center Project. And believe me, I actually skipped over a lot of other things <laughs> Jackie Patterson does. Please join me in welcoming Jackie. Okay. So I will oh, yeah. just unfreeze the screen so we can see what we're presenting. Okay, good. Well, I will, um, in the meantime, just uh, thank, first of all, Provost Alyssa Gilliam for, uh, for that lovely and gracious introduction and for having me. I'll also thank Ian Hoat for also hosting this event. And uh, thank you all for being here. And definitely thank Karina, who's been just amazing from the very beginning and her patience and her uh, diligence and her good communication. And so, and also all the folks who are behind the scenes, the, the nameless folks who have contributed to it. So, I hope that's working. I don't know. I have to try. Do you have notes on me? Nope. Okay, cool. Just hit the arrows. Okay. All right. So, move your microphone up. Okay. Right down the high squirrel. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> so, I am going to. 
actually, it's not going to probably be as possible to start to play a video, is it? I can just get by. Oh, can I just fiddle with that again? Okay. okay sorry. <laughs> All right. So I'll say if this video works, and if it doesn't, we'll it make will sure work. you get the link. Okay, good. Um, so <laughs> this video is, uh, I always like to, we, we as, a, uh, as a Chisholm Legacy Project and those of us in the climate justice movement have these principles called the Hamish Principles of Democratic Organizing. And one of the principles is letting the people speak for themselves. So I have the, the honor to be able to go around and, and do these presentations, but we really want to the greatest extent possible for people to tell their own stories. And so this video will be hopefully um, some, uh, a group from Baytown, Texas, telling their own story. They're on the front lines of environmental injustice with uh, toxic facilities around them. And they're also on the front, front lines of the impacts in terms of climate impacts, uh, being in a community that has, was ravaged by Hurricane Harvey and continues to be ravaged by the various um, storms that come through. So, um, here you go. Okay, good. <laughs> so, I can just... Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so let's see. Okay. Okay. All right. Not embedded. So. Yeah. Let's. Okay. Do this. Share screen with us again. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Bear so, with me, you all. Sorry. Yeah. And just so you know, I'm not going to play. Obviously, it's a little, a little complicated, but um, but we'll make sure you all get the links and I'll reference them as, as we go forward. But at least I want you to see this one because yeah, maybe principle. you can. Yeah. Just so sorry. That's okay. No, it's totally my fault. I should have warned about the video situation. I think I even just lost the Zoom call. So. Share screen. Here's the <laughs> video. We're gonna do this one more time and then. It should work. Okay. That's gone on that screen too. There we go. All right. Whenever you're ready, Jackie. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, um, and one thing I will, I'll, I'll say this. Oh, there it is. Interesting. The city of Baytown is made of old money, lower to middle class families and pollution. But if you get a job at a chemical plant, you don't have time to think of a solution. I guess my brother, my uncle, and my cousins are sellouts because they went industrial instead of the drug route. Refinery city lights and pipes run along the Gulf Coast. The smoke boasts with sulfur air. It's a wonder. Anyone's able to take a breath. We're so used to it, we forget. Soon, the sons and daughters won't be able to drink the water. They say the first priority is the people, but the people are the ones being excluded and uprooted. Just ask Archer Courts, ask George Washington Carver Elementary, or ask the Suburbanites. Exxon Sacrifice, a.k.a. Brownwood Neighborhood. God bless social media, but Flint ain't the only case of complexion without protection. Baytown, a.k.a. the Dirty Bay, is surrounded by giant toxins threatening the city in every way. We see the huge steel from our window sills make jokes as we choke. We've been possibly dying from this kind of poison oak. It's no mystery that the black and brown communities are being targeted. <coughs> black lives matter, but not when they're expendable and making money is good for the market. Give them a fine, it's fine. They can afford it. We live with the headaches 
The shortness of breath and watery eyes, they keep building and we pay for it. Constantly trying to heal ourselves and repel the environmental destruction. Breathe it in. Then breathe out. Okay, and I'll just say too that uh, the somewhat the irony slash tragedy of it is that that was made in 2016. So the fact that they're wearing masks and gloves has nothing to do with COVID 19 mm -hmm. and everything with the fact that, sorry, there's another. <laughs> the fact that there is, uh, that, that this is the reality of our communities where the air isn't safe to breathe, where there's contaminants in our air long before it became the universal challenge for, for people across the, the country and world. The surfaces weren't, uh, weren't safe to touch for our communities long before that was the case for the, for the rest of the world. And so this, uh, this, this video and the themes that were expressed throughout are, will be themes that you'll see throughout uh, this, this conversation. And so, um, so I wanted to start us off with the historical context of where, where we are. I'm uh, grateful for the, the land and injustice uh, acknowledgement that Karina gave at the beginning, because we know that this country, and, and contrary to the, the rel relatively romanticized notions of these explorers and so forth, um, seeking, um, seeking uh, adventurers, as, as, as was often the characterization of Columbus and his cohorts, and I, I show the irony of being um, in Columbus, but anyway, um, so, uh, <laughs> but, um, but the, uh, the, the fact is that people came with a, a, an agenda of extraction, and that's what they found, and that's what they, what they implemented in terms of extracting from, from extracting murder displacement of the original inhabitants uh, of this land, and then going forward to then go to Sub-Saharan Africa and extract people from their land, from their history, from their families, from their heritage, from their culture, and put people in the hulls of ships to be the enslaved labor that built the infrastructure for this nation. So often when I'm doing acknowledgments, I do both land acknowledgments and labor acknowledgments in terms of what many of the structures, the ground on which we walk and so so forth, is was built by enslaved labor of people who were who were then made property, who were also the basis for capitalism in terms of being some of the first commodities that were traded on the market that continues to do so much damage in this extractive economy. And then we have the land that is also extracted from um, whether it where whether it's then in terms of people seeking spices and minerals and so forth as the as the um, the basis in the impetus the original journey to today where this extraction of uh, of the of the materials that we are used to to create energy. And then we have all of this uh, institutionalized in the people who are in office who are who are really, and we'll talk more about uh, the unhealthy relationship between corporations and money and power, but who are really there to, to maintain and or advance the status quo of, of this imbalance of, of power. And so we see how that's represented through the policies from our land policies to our finance policies to our labor rules and so forth and so on. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and Martin Luther King says, I never intend to adjust myself to circumstances that will give, or economic conditions that will give necessities, take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few. And that, again, is the very base of the extractive economy in which we find ourselves. So when I was with the NACP, we did a series of, of reports to start to, to, to lay out these circumstances, and particularly as it relates to environmental and climate injustice, cold-blooded putting profits before people. We worked um, on GIS um, mapping and worked with EPA data, census data, to map out the coal-fired power plants throughout the entire nation and found, of course, that they're disproportionately located in communities of color, BIPOC communities, and also disproportionately located in lower income communities. But one key piece that we have to keep in mind is that often people will say low income um, communities of color, or they'll, they'll, they'll kind of lump those together. But the fact of the matter is 
that as Dr. Robert Bullard has found and others, Manuel Pastor, Dr. Manuel Pastor, that race even above income is the number one indicator of the placement of toxic facilities. An African-American family making $50,000 a year is more likely to live next to a toxic facility than a white American um, um, person, family live making $15,000 a year. So it's a very stark racial um, issue as, as we talk about toxic facilities. And so, not only do we have the placement of coal-fired power plants, but we also have the cradle-to-grave um, uh, impacts of the coal industry. Uh, 76,000 coal miners have died of black lung disease since 1968. While the National Mining Association that consists of the very companies that employ the workers that are supposed to be uh, at least uh, partners in the wellness of the workers, if not stewards, given that they're the ones that are putting people in harm's way. They, they, but they pay the National Mining Association to fight against the very laws that would protect them from the coal mine dust and to have those environmental occupational um, laws in place. So, and, and that's at the cost of 76,000 lives and counting. So the best statistic was from 2006. So, so many more since then. Then we have the folks who are on the front lines of the combustion of coal, folks like this family in the Four Corners region out in, um, in, the, in the southwest. This family is behind a coal, in front of a coal-fired power plant, one of four coal-fired power plants within a 30-mile radius of where they live. They talk about the, people, the kids in the family with asthma. They talk about the uh, person who's pictured there who died of a respiratory illness. And they also described how, this is a Diné family, a Navajo family. They also talk about how the person on the left is uh, pregnant. And we know that, come, that one of the things that comes out of these smokestacks is, is mercury, which is a known endocrine disruptor. But to make the, the ultimate in injustice here is that those four coal fire power plants go to pipe to, to um, power Los Angeles, um, Phoenix, Las Vegas. Well, Los, Los Angeles has such, um, since weaned from, from coal, but that was what these, these coal fire power plants went to power. And um, they, like 70% of the people on these Navajo lands, do not have electricity. So that even, they don't even have access to the power from the, the plants that's, that are poisoning their air, their water, their land. And so these are the, 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 the gross injustices of our energy sector and so many of these other sectors. They also, on their front porch, you see those two coolers because they, like 70% of the people on the land, don't have running water in their homes either. And so when these plants were introduced to the Navajo leaders, they said, oh, we're going to be bringing economic prosperity to, to the land and to the to the area, including jobs for for your family members. There's nobody. There's no man um, pictured in those in this image, because the men in the family, like so many other families, are often other states, only able to come home every few, few weeks or months, because there there weren't the jobs that were promised when these plants came came into the area. They they came in with job. They came in with fewer jobs that were that were promised, and then they came in with people in the jobs that were there in the plants already. And so the community is really it's the ultimate in extracting from the community, polluting the community, contaminating the community with no real benefits for the community. Um, we did this report, Fumes Across the Fence Line, the Health Impacts of Air Pollution from Oil and Gas Facilities. It also found similarly that oil and gas facilities are disproportionately located in BIPOC communities. This image is from the Cesar Chavez High School in Houston, Texas. It was taken by the Texas Environmental Justice Services. And that oil refinery is one of five oil refineries within a 10 mile radius of the school. And so you see it's right there um, next to the school, right next to homes and so forth, so forth in the community. And again, this is another profits over people situation because it, like with the Navajo leaders, the local leaders there have, and including the zoning boards, don't have real zoning laws per se. So this is why you have, this is the ultimate in mixed use. Um, um, zoning where because they wanted to make sure that they were able to to get the, the economic benefits as a city from these facilities they 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 had kind of a no holds barred in terms of how they operate where they operate and who they operate on and so these are the communities black and brown communities that are paying the price for the the toxins that are coming out of out of these smokestacks um 
all know about fracking and its impacts, um, and, and which is everything from the, the contamination of the water, as you see here, the flammability of the water right here in Ohio and <laughs> Granger Township. There was a home that exploded uh, because of uh, fracking, and they tested the water and found that there was a 20% uh, explosivity level, which was 20 times higher than the allowable explosivity level, which I was struck by the fact that there is a lot an allowable explosivity level. Um, so, in heavens, but um, anyway, so that's. Um, so the, but this is what's happening in so many places um, across the country in terms of these types of explosions. Also in places like um, Oklahoma, the, where fracking is, is rampant there, there, the geologists found that, um, that the that fracking tied directly to the fact that on average before they had 30 earthquakes per year, about 3.5 on the Richter scale, and now they have plus 300 plus earthquakes every year, about 3.5 of Richter scale. Geologists try to tap that directly to fracking. But of course, when the, the governor was called on to ban fracking, again, this is the unholy marriage of money and politics. They did not <laughs> pass that, um, that, uh, that law in spite of the, the call of the people to do so. And so, huh. sorry, I pushed it, um, enter instead of, uh, <laughs> let me just get, sorry about that. <laughs> And so we see how these types of things start to, to play out. Um, this is a report that we did a few years ago, Lights Out in the Cold, Reforming Utility Shutoff Policies as if Human Rights Matter. And in that report, we, we, we did it after stories of people who were on the front lines of having their electricity turned off for non-payment, a story about a, a, a a single father with five children who had his electricity turned off for nine payment and he went and he got a generator so that they could um, have heat in their homes it was in the dead of winter in Michigan and but and he also lived in a neighborhood that he was concerned about uh, about the security of this generator that he had invested in so he brought the generator inside for safekeeping so the entire family passed away from carbon monoxide poisoning as a result. So again, um, another family of, of uh, nine where they had their um, electricity turned, they had their oil and gas turned off for non-payment. No, I think, yeah, yeah, oil and gas turned off for non-payment. They used a space heater to heat their home and the, you know, the space heaters is number the, one of the number one causes of fires and sure enough a fire burned down their home one of the times when i was doing one of these presentations someone who, who was in the room was a, a trauma-informed nurse and she talked about a situation where a child came into her care because the house had burned down because of uh because their oil and gas was turned off and they used a space heater but the reason that this child came into her care was because he tried to commit suicide he was nine years old and it was because his mother put that space heater in his home when the oil and gas went, I mean, in his room when the oil and gas was turned off because she wanted her son to be warm. And he blamed himself when the, when the family lost their whole, whole home as a result. And there are really way too many of them, unfortunately, but that's why, but that's what compelled us to put out this report, which um, at that time we were using to really push for a moratorium on these shutoffs. And it then really came back into play when COVID-19 came along and it was instrumentally used to, to, to push for the oracle, for the moratorium that we eventually did get there. So this, I'll end with this story on that note in terms of another situation where it's New Jersey, a grandmother in New Jersey in 2018, in the dead of one of these heat waves that we're seeing more and more of because of climate change. Um, she had she she had fallen behind in her bills. Her her son found out that he was behind. She was behind, and she had he actually paid off her bill, two hundred dollars, paid it off. But two days later, the com the the uh, company that that payment hadn't caught up in their system, and they turned shut off her electricity regardless. And um, she was of course dependent on this um, oxygen machine for her for her breathing, and so she died as a result. So again, people after person after person paying, paying the price of property with their lives in a land of plenty, in one of the richest in the world, people are paying the price of poverty with their lives. So as we think about um, uh, the, in the uh, video, the person said that Flint is in the only case of, of, uh, of uh, lack of protection. Um, and so, and, and the Flint, Flint situation is a cautionary tale 
we know that how the it wasn't just a matter of the water getting contaminated it was a matter of all the things that happened before that the underregulated pollution that happened that resulted in the 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 Flint River becoming this toxic cesspool. And the fact that when Flint, when the when the uh, companies that were operating in Flint decided it would be more uh, lucrative for them to operate overseas in terms of their manufacturing, they pulled up stakes and pulled out eighty five thousand jobs out of the Flint economy, which was the Flint economy, <laughs> and left them without the, the economic wherewithal to to be able to operate. And so, especially with the abruptness with which it happened and no investment in helping them to make a just transition to a new economy that's not based on this manufacturing. So as a result of that disinvestment, the, the emergency financial manager law was in, put in place, which displaced the democracy of Flint, that displaced the democratically elected city council, the democratically elected mayor, and put in place instead the emergency financial manager manager who was making all the decisions for Flint. And that's who decided based on an economic analysis, someone who didn't live in Flint, who didn't have kids in Flint, who didn't drink the water in Flint, making the decision um, about, about moving the water supply from the Detroit River to the Flint water River, which resulted in the poisoning of 100,000 people, including children, with um, irreversible um, effects there. And so, we have to really recognize the uh, the underpinnings of some of these circumstances that are happening. So that was our energy system. We talk about our waste system after the the person that we talk about the BP oil drilling disaster. The already landfills are disproportionately cited in low income communities and communities of color. When the BP oil drilling disaster happened, then that waste disproportionately went into communities of color that where those um, <coughs> landfills were already cited. So the POC in this uh, in this uh, schematic um, stands for people of color. These are the proportions of, of people of color who are in the communities that receive the most waste from the biological disaster. What also is intersectional here is the fact that the communities that the, the community, what the communities were exposed to were the, the uh, waste that was soaked in Corexit, which was used as the dispersant after the BP oil drilling disaster. And Corexit is banned in 90 countries. But again, because of our unholy marriage of, um, of money and politics, our American Chemical Society and other trade associations fight against inclusion of anything in the toxic relief in, in, inventory. In the, and so the Toxic Substances Control Act is, is, um, is, is basically left as powerless in some ways because of the lack of inclusion of the toxins that in, in that um, in that uh, list of toxic materials. And so instead of these landfills be, that are cited for household waste, so cited for non-hazardous material, so that means it's a whole different type of lack of handling where these, where what, what goes into these landfills can end up in, um, you know, in, in water streams and air, in air because of the way they handle it and so forth. But without that, that hazardous um, designation, then it's really the communities that suffer from that lack of designation. So again, just hoping you can kind of get the systemic nature, the depth of it, and the fact that this isn't a system that you could just tweak here and there. <laughs> There's not just like some simple reforms that you can make in order to make this uh, a just and equitable system. And so this is why I kind of go into a lot of detail of giving these examples after examples. And so this is similarly with the landfill incinerators disproportionately located in BIPOC communities, Black, Indigenous, People of Color communities. And the, the toxins that come out of here include mercury, arsenic, lead, benzene, which is a known carcinogen, and again, disproportionately located in our communities. We work a lot around agriculture. So when we talk about our food systems, there's everything from the uh, factory farms in terms of the what they call PFOs, con confined animal feeding operations. Not first is just the inhumane treatment of the animals in general, and then secondly, it is the way the way the uh, work is done. The animals are contained and so forth ends up with these toxic conditions that again often BIPOC communities are the ones that are host to these um, these CAFOs. And then when we talk about agriculture as well. We, we talk about our farming systems. Um, folks may be familiar with Monsanto and this notion of these single cycle seeds that they were using, but people often also call terminator seeds because they only have one cycle. Challenge with those is that in different places, they, they have a viral impact. So if you have a farm where you're just using millennia 
millennia old seeds, just the traditional um, seeds that re rely on our ecosystem and our natural regeneration of it. Um, and then you have these, these uh, manufactured seeds blow into your land. It can actually have a viral impact and now you're dependent on these single cycle seeds. And that's what's exactly happening with various farmers. Vandana Shiva has done a lot of uh, study around this and this um, article from Seeds of Suicide uh, to Seeds of Hope. Why are Indian farmers committing suicide? How can we stop this tragedy? So we start to see the types of advocacy that's needed to, to turn this around that's starting to advance. Talk about our water systems. We have places like the Red Dog Mine in, um, in Alaska, which has violated the Clean Water Act 600 times and counting. And meanwhile, it continues. Like they have a fine, as the person said in the video, again, I told you it was going to be a recurring thing. Give them a fine, it's fine. When you're, when you're, when you are um, making millions of dollars in profits, the fines that these people get are, are negligible. They're a rounding error in their budget. And so they just continue with impunity. Well, in the human world, there's a three strikes laws and so forth. So we don't get to, we don't get that luxury. But again, when you have a, an economy that is so um, based in, in the corporate, what we call a corporatocracy, these are the kinds of uh, violations that, that can go on un, you know, unpunished and unhindered, really. And yet at the same time, when you have the violations of the Clean Water Act, we have um, people at the same time having their water shut off for non-payment for a couple of bills, again, which is another thing that came up during um, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. When we talk about transportation and goods movement, similarly, BIPOC communities are more likely to live next to um, places with near roadway air pollution and suffering the health impacts, including shipping channels and the health impacts of shipping channels. So putting all of that together, the environmental justice impacts of these uh, challenges are many in terms of the, whether, whether it's air pollution, water pollution, soil contamination, it's getting into our bodies, causing respiratory illnesses. African-American children are three to five times more likely to enter the hospital because of an asthma attack and two to three times more likely to die of an asthma attack. We know we have these high rates of diabetes, high blood pressure and so forth and so on. And so these, these, these challenges are, are, are proliferate. This is one of the an example of one of the families who had their water contaminated with because of the uh, landfill um, liner eroded that was next to their home. What was a tragedy is that this person, uh, Sheila, Sheila Hope Orsted, she found that her, her father was uh, dying of a rare form of cancer and she started to do some um, some asking around and realized that her father was one of many people in that community who had rare forms of cancer. The kids were being born with, with um, birth challenges. And then she started to do some investigation and found out that years before, she herself ended up with breast cancer and had to have a double mastectomy. And she found out that years before the landfill had been, you know, land liner had eroded and trichloroethylene, which is a known carcinogen, ended up in the water. But the tragedy and the crime of it all was that they, the white families got letters saying not to drink the water. The um, animal shelter, which was next to the landfill, um, also was put on an alternate form of water. The Black families were not informed at all, and they drank that, fam that water for years. So the NAACP and Legal Defense Fund ended up getting involved, and so they were able to get financial compensation, but there's no financial compensation for losing your family members and for the challenges that these communities face. Fortunately, they are not alone. So again, I, I, telling other people's stories is both um, heartbreaking um, and it also, you know, it also uh, is important for us to really realize the, the real human impacts of these challenges. Um, so there's others, but I feel I'm on slide 36 of 134. So I'm gonna have to pick up the pace significantly. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so. This, I'm gonna skip, well, actually, I'm not gonna skip that, so I'm gonna try and do it fast. But uh, this person, Antoine, um, his family, we were doing one of these um, trainings and his his um, grandparents came into the training, they came hustling in late. They were like, yes, we have to take Antoine to the doctor again. This is our this is our regular routine, having to take our, son, our grandson to the hospital for his asthma. And, um, and they talked about, you know, of course they love their, their grandson, but they talked about the real impact in terms of not being able to be in line for promotions and so forth at work because they're unreliable workers because of 
because of the situation. So they send us pictures of these medicines that he's dependent on to be able to breathe as he goes day to day. They sent a picture of him looking on while a child was playing in a fountain, saying that this is really a, kind of symbolic of his life or emblematic of his life because he is always looking on while other kids are playing, but his lung capacity is such that he can't play like other kids. On poor air quality days, he can't go to school other kids. And we know that whether it's the asthma that's keeping the kids out of school or it's they're in school and the lead and the manganese that they're breathing in from these smokestacks interferes with their ability to learn. Or it's the fact that if you're living next to a toxic facility, on average, your property values are 15% lower. And, um, and that and property values are what finances our school system. So it means that school teachers themselves are also getting sick and not able to stay, stay in school. And so the quality of the education <laughs> is, is compromised for, for kids. And we all know according to, well, you may or may not know, but I know that according to studies, if you're not on grade level by the third grade, you're more likely to enter into the school to prison pipeline. And so this is, these are the types of intersections that are real for, for communities in terms of how all these things work. We also know that no, that in these circumstances is more likely for, uh, for people to respond and provide aid when it is a situation where it's a white, white community versus an African-American community or a, a BIPOC community in general um, to address uh, challenges, whether it's the Flint water crisis, the Alabama eight mile Mercaptan spill, or it's the East Chicago, Indiana arsenic contamination that happened there. All of those took years and some of them aren't even close to being remedied. Yet when the Porter Ranch gas leak happened in Southern California within months, they had capped the gas leak. They had been they paid been paid four four million dollars and counting in compensation for what happened there. And this is the this is the pattern of, of disparity in terms of, um, of of addressing these issues. And so that was a kind of all on the driver side of the climate continuum in terms of the same same driver driving dynamics that that um, drive climate change also harm the communities that are in harm that are in the way of climate change. And then when we talk about the impact of climate change, also the same, same kind of dynamics in terms of who's most vulnerable, who's most likely to be impacted. Globally, most vulnerable nations to impacts of climate change, the, all of them are BIPOC um, nations and seven out of 10 are Afro-descended nations, whether it's in the Caribbean or in, uh, in, Africa, in, in Africa itself. We talk about sea level rise. This, um, this uh, image in the upper right hand corner is of the Maldives where they actually had a cabinet meeting underwater in 2009 to illustrate to the world that that's where they're going to be in 20 years and now it's less, it's like eight years. And so they literally had a cabinet meeting underwater to, to as kind of us, but also as an education to other folks um, to help them to see what was going on. And so, but here in the US, whether it's Norfolk, Virginia, Kivalina, in Alaska, um, and right, we've already had communities that have been displaced by the combination of sea level rise and the land sinking from oil drilling. The Il de Charles, John Charles Band of the Biloxi Chittimaca Choctaw had to move their entire populace in southern Louisiana to another um, landmass because their land was no longer inhabitable. Then we talk about shifts in agricultural yields. When you have communities that are more likely to get Cheetos, Doritos, or Taquitos than kale or quinoa or anything resembling something that's healthy with nutrients and antioxidants and so forth. These are the kind of situations that are only going to be exacerbated by climate change and the shifts in agricultural yields that result. And so then we have the extreme weather events, whether it's the, the flooding, <laughs> the tornadoes, the, um, the hurricanes that we all know are going to intensify. And we were just talking yesterday in a smaller meeting here, and I see some of the folks from the meeting about the urban heat island effect that, that, that's being seen as causing, um, of course, uh, health challenges with everything from, from stroke and so forth. And this is in communities that are already um, vulnerable to those conditions because of high blood pressure, um, diabetes, and so forth. And then there's also a tie even to birth outcomes. Already, infant mortality rates are higher in BIPOC communities. And the urban heat island effects is actually making that even worse. And so and then there's the intersections. We all know about the uh, kind of living while black um, scenarios that have taken place 
uh, whether it's the Yale student falling asleep, the folks in Starbucks, the, the people coming out of the Airbnb or otherwise, in the context of disasters, this can have, or normally it has deadly impacts, but in the context of disasters, that's also exacerbated after Hurricane Katrina. This is the same kind of scenario, same day, same um, associated press that told the story in two different ways. When it's white people who were who were um, seeking food after the uh, disaster, it says two residents raid through chef deep floodwaters after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store. But when it's a young African-American um, man, it says a young man walks through chest deep floodwaters after looting a grocery store. So a very different characterization, which results in very different actions. So white people are just considered to be just kind of doing what they need to do to survive. But a black kid is considered to be looting. So this is where we find the criminalization that happens. This is where we find the sanctioned, state sanctioned murder that happens, where people call people, they were on the, the, the Danziger Bridge, just trying to get back into town to look for their neighbors, and they didn't know where their neighbors were. And instead of you know being aided in finding their neighbors, people called the police on them, assuming they were up to no good, and the police shot and killed them, unarmed um, civilians on the bridge. And this is what we see is the impact of the, of the, racializa the racialization and the racial profiling that happens. And this is why we see the call for, for Black Lives to Matter. Then we have the gender injustices that are intersectional as well, whether it's women being more impacted, um, women being used as weapons of war in various um, nations, and um, the, the uh, indigenous women and these predator economies that are arising around these oil and gas um, um, operations, and, and, and this tying in to the missing and murdered indigenous women and, and women who are experiencing sexual assault along the, the pipeline. When we talk about the climate force migration um, with immigration um, increasing, it's in, it, people are experiencing situations where they're praying for rain in order to just be able to have um, um, crops and so forth in order to be able to survive. And, um, and they have no choice but to migrate just to seek a place where they can, where they can eat. Um, and so, and feed their children. And so when we talk about this climate-driven migration, often it's, there's this notion of people coming to take something or people seeking riches or, or whatever, but people are coming to a place where we're 4% of the global population, but 25% of the emissions that drive climate change. So even if we weren't just good neighbors uh, sharing some of our wealth, at the very least we can have responsibility for the fact that we're the ones that are driving people from their land. But instead, we're putting people in cages or greeting them on the horseback with whips um, and so forth. And so this is a quote from Warshan Shire, a Kenyan-born Somali poet. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. And speaking of Somalia, I was in a meeting of, uh, it was a gender justice meeting, and this woman, Tracy Coons, who is a Louisiana waterkeeper, back then, it was like in 2010 or so, she talked about um, how she actually found common ground with Somali pilots, which was really interesting. Here <laughs> she was, you know, and she said, because like she can see the level of desperation that would drive you to do anything to protect your family and to be able to provide for your family and your children. And that was a really poignant moment for everybody who was in the room, because we know that there are these communities that are driven to that level of desperation and again in a place where all of these, all of our nations in some ways have plenty. It's just a matter of where that plenty is going. And so this is the, the challenge that we find. And so even as we try to um, develop climate action plans or develop, you know, do, do opportunity zones or community development block grants or whatever all these different interventions are, uh, if, if they're not driven by community, the impact could actually be just as bad as the original challenge that we're facing. And so whether it's gentrification and displacement or otherwise, these are some of the unintended, uh, in some cases, consequences. In some cases, it, it, these things are masquerading as, um, as good, but it actually ends up being a windfall for developers. And so when we talk about the systems fueling these inequities, uh, the Octopus was put together by International Forum on Globalization. It really talked about some of these mega billionaires that are controlling so much of our systems, whether it's the media, academia, um, Congress, and our courts, and so forth. It really ends up in the displacement of our democracy. 
We put out a report some years ago called Fossil Fuel Foolery, the 10, top 10 manipulation tactics of the fossil fuel industry. They really started to lay out the ways that the fossil fuel companies are driving our, our corporatocracy. So I'm not going to go through these because, again, I know we don't have that much time and we'll make sure that you get access to these slides. But it's things like even having a, um, even the, the Halliburton applying for an exemption from the, the Safe Drinking Water Act for the fracking. The fact that there's even a form you can fill out to request an exemption from the Safe Drinking Water Act, again, just really points to all that's wrong in our, in our systems and our society. So, and we see, you know, the, again, the, the, the influences in the status quo and how and why in terms of, you know, the, uh, talking about regulations in that same way, whether it's Corexit that's banned in 90 countries, being in our, you know, in landfills that are cited for household waste like paper towel rolls and so forth, or, or otherwise, this kind of uh, demonization of regulations that are actually supposed to be keeping us safe video I would have shown you, but A, time, and B, um, complexity, but just moving into solutions. Um, so really, in terms of these the solutions that we are advancing, it's really first pushing for the type of um, just transition, which is moving away from an extractive economy into a, a living economy or a generative economy, a solidarity econ economy, moving away from militarization, um, enclosure of wealth and power, into uh, cooperation, um, really caring for the sacred, which is a relationship with each other, relationship with the, with the earth. And so these are the Hemes principles of democratic organizing, really pointing out the pathways for how we do that together with frontline leadership. And so starting with advancing true democracy is a, a book that I um, authored with, with another Britain Maka journalist, want to fight, support clean energy, fight for voting rights, really overturning Citizens United, which assigns corporate personhood, really engaging in civic participation, whether it's in zoning boards or public utilities commissions or school boards, having the voice of the people in each and every one of those um, places, making sure you put uh, representational governance in place and leadership at all levels. This is a, a, an example of, of what it looks like when people really do start to come together this is a, the solidarity. It's in Michigan, Highland Park, Michigan, where their electricity for their streetlights was cut off by DTE. They got together and they said, okay, we're going to now um, raise money and get solar powered streetlights. And they were able to do that. This is another video I encourage you to watch. Um, Amy Mays, where I went to Phoenix. I mean, I've been to the equator multiple times and I have not been as hot as when I went to Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> um, I walked out like a, off of the plane at, late at night and I thought maybe like, it was just like exhaust from the shuttle buses that was making it so hot that I just realized that was just the air <laughs> in general. But um, so Amy Mays had her electricity turned off for non-payment multiple times. And, she, and then they started to put out not only just fees, but also she had to put a deposit in. It's like you weren't able to afford the bill, bill in the first place, and now you're making a pay deposit to get it back on. So she just stopped struggling and decided to just save up the money that she would have paid every month to that, for the electricity bill. And every few months, she would buy a solar panel. And the next few months, she would buy a solar panel. She just got coolers, just like the Navajo whole family, to keep her cold things in. And she just kind of you know, invested in, in the solar array. And then she was an electrician. So she got up on her own roof and installed these solar panels. And now she's totally off the grid. Um, and wrote this article, Utility Greed Locked Me Out of the Grid, but Solar Panels Set Me Free. <laughs> and it's, it's very true. And so we were back in that same area where the, in the Four Corners region where the Navajo family was. And we came together under this moniker, Power Without Pollution, Energy Without Injustice. <laughs> And there we have the Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, Southwest Workers Union, Eastern Michigan Environmental Action Coalition, and others all coming together to, to build this coalition of power. And that coalition of power resulted, this person was with, uh, Walea Johns was with Native Renewables. Now she's in the Department of, of the Interior um, working on these very issues. And that's what's happened with people powered um, organizing. And so as we start to see these opportunities arising from people's organizing, this is the work where, um, where women are being trained to do solar panel installation, installations, where people who were formerly incarcerated are now being um, trained to do energy efficiency retro retrofits with solar power from, from um, that was Colorado Springs. This is in Los Angeles with the Homeboy Industries, 
This is in Baltimore with Power 52, where they have a training program to do this. This is one of the installations <laughs> that results from the Black Mesa Water Coalition in Arizona. And this is in Los Angeles, where this is actually on top of a domestic violence um, um, transitional housing, where the women who are in residence in the transitional housing were trained to do their own solar installations. And now they're out of the transitional housing. They, are, they, they have their own jobs in doing solar installations and they are in their own homes as a result. And we know that for the financial ties are one of the things that keeps women in abusive relationships often. And so now through this initiative, they were able to be free of their, of their circumstances. Um, work like the Indigenous Environmental Network on water protection, work around food justice with the Global um, Eco Village Network. And we see the fruits of that labor literally um, in terms of folks um, first tilling the soil on one hand and then enjoying the bounty of the, 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 the uh, fruits of the land. Another video I would have shown you, Appetite for Change out of, um, out of Minnesota, um, but you'll have to watch that yourself. And then just moving on to some of the policies we need, the Portland Clean Energy Fund, the Maryland um, Offshore Wind Bill, uh, work around the Green New Deal and its principles and practices. And, um, and then moving on to some of the formations that result in this, the Black Labor Convening on Just Transition, and the work that we need to also do on what we call kind of the soft things, making sure that we have social cohesion, because that's key to actually being able to, to mobilize and organize together. So this is some of that work around restorative justice, healing justice. And so as a university, I wanted to make sure that we included this, this, these couple of slides on community academic partnerships and its crucial, crucial role in addressing the so, racial inequities. And so the key aims of this partnerships um, include demonstrating intersectionality and justifying the imperative for systems change. These are some of the past projects that we've done. The Lights Out in the Cold report that I mentioned, it actually started with um, someone who was in a university, George Washington University's professor we had worked with on this battle. Um, on one year, he asked us, okay, we have students who would be willing to help. What, what is something that you could use some help with? And I said, I would love to, to look at, do a state-by-state -state review of all of the shutoff policies. And so the student, Carolyn Kirk, then did that and provided that to us. And then we took that and put all the stories and the framing and the demands around it. And that became the Lights Out in the Cold report. Um, right now we're working on a paper, Environmental Racism in the School to Prison Industrial Complex Pipeline. And that started with me speaking at a, uh, a conference on disasters. And the student walked up to me and said, you know, I've been doing this work around prison labor and disasters. And I would love to work with you on putting something together that looks at the state by state policies around prison labor. And so then that became this larger intersectional report on environmental racism in school and prison industrial complex pipeline. Cold blooded also started with a spreadsheet <laughs> that someone had put together, uh, like I said, the GIS mapping and so forth. We're also putting out a report before these upcoming elections on the democratization of the PUCs and the PSCs. And that, of course, started with us reaching out and to Harvard University and a, a couple of students said that they'd be willing to do the background research on that. So really the key to all of this has been the frontline communities leading and saying what they want and the universities then providing those resources to actually help to make that happen. And then we provide the framing, we provide the stories, we provide the platform for telling the story, but we combine those efforts to push for the type of changes that we wanna see in the, wor in, the, in the world. So these are some of the critical topics that we, we want to see more on, um, whether it's the immigration policies and practices and climate resilience, racial profiling, police brutality, um, mass incarceration, um, race and gentrification, um, climate resilient infrastructure, um, the, the impacts of underrepresented people of color in STEM, in STEM or STEAM, so to speak, um, and, and so forth and so on. So I will um, end with this uh, piece around telling our own stories and the importance of community leadership and community perspectives in terms of winning the battle of the narrative. There, there's a proverb that says, until lions write their own history, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. I'm a big watcher of like night, late night uh, television, particularly comedians to help to put all this craziness into some kind of <laughs> level of humor. <laughs> and I was watching uh, Saturday Night Live and they were saying, 
um, they had kind of on the weekend update section, they, they had, they were talking about, um, uh, there was a story told in the local newspaper, a hunter thinking deer was dead, was injured as the deer jumped up and gored him. And in the regular newspaper, it said deer attacks hunter. That was a headline. But then it was like, or as the story was told in the deer community, serial killer injured as a victim fights back. <laughs> so that is the power of perspective. So um, I will wrap there. Another video I would have shown you, but uh, I'll just leave him my con contact information. So thank you. Just like two questions. I'm gonna have to let you go off to all of your other wonderful meetings. I know your schedule's jam packed, but does anybody have questions? Oh yeah. Um, thank you. This is incredible, and wonderful. I, just to your and um, in terms of partnerships between community and academia, many of the topics that you listed are things that we have students and faculty and people here working on. And I think maybe where the bridge needs to be strengthened is to the community. And you had some examples of how that's happened kind of in a one-off way with people coming up and talking to you after a session. Do you have other examples that are maybe perhaps more systematic or purposeful in terms of building that connection? Uh, so unfortunately, there's not enough in the way of uh, systematic and purposeful that a lot of it does happen in that similar way. And, and But one thing we are doing and publishing imminently is a guidance document on research and community, uh, research institutions and communities working together, really laying out examples like our own examples, as well as examples from like Wayne State University working with Be the People of Detroit and others uh, that are similar. Um, the Harvard University School of Public Health working with um, with the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization in Peru in Chicago, which is what resulted in, um, in unearthing the ties between public health and coal-fired power plants, which led to the development of a clean air ordinance, which led to the shutdown of two coal-fired power plants in the South Side of Chicago. So we'll in, we're including all of those examples, as well as including what the keys were to the success in those partnerships. And how people and how the partnerships were formed and, and so forth. So stay tuned. We'll have that out in a few weeks, actually. The drafts are waiting. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, so for those that are kind of building on that are looking to do this work, mm -hmm. what is a good equitable way to start is to read up on the, the, the Yamas, Yamas principles and then just reach out to a partner and say, I, I I'm going to make some mistakes, but I'd like to try to negotiate how we can do this well. Yeah, I mean, that's that. that's what we found has been the most, uh, you know, the most fruitful partnerships we've had have been just that very thing where people are saying, people come with that humility. That's the important thing is to come with that humility and just like an offering, an offering as a fairly uh, blank check offering versus like, I want to do this, you know, can I do this with you? But like, here's what I've got. I'm here to help, you know. Open to being directed in terms of my the errors of my ways. I'm just here for this movement. So yeah, and I'll also say too that there are various kind of fellowships and those kind of things also out there as well. That would be entry points. University of Michigan, um, for example, has a fellowship program. If you start a fellowship program that you then put out folks who are available, then people would definitely gravitate towards that. So if you want to do that more formally as a university, then that would be an idea as well. But I would say. What you just said is definitely. You don't realize you just charged the entire university. <laughs> you mentioned our big competitor. Uh oh. So, uh, <laughs> it's a bit of a program. <laughs> Are you hopeful that? I mean, I, I had the pleasure last week of spending some time with the, the gentleman who oversees USDA Region Five's uh, linkage between tribal communities and these really active environmental justice. <laughs> And there's a lot of resources that Congress has, has given to USDTA. It's more than the dollar amounts. It's, it's a requirement that they spend 40% of their resources on impacting. So it's in and time that all of the all of my friends in these regulatory agencies are like, we don't really know how to do that, but it's such a powerful policy statement to yes. say you were 
But is that something you are focused on? And how hopeful are you that that's going to create some new resources and opportunities and a pipeline to bring the kind of partnership together to solve these problems? That haven't, there haven't been those incentives in, in law and in, in the past. I think it's really an interesting time. Yes, it absolutely is. No, absolutely true. And in fact, I had made a note to myself to reach out to Karina to connect me to some of the folks that we were speaking with yesterday from the Columbus Sustainability Office, because I wanted to make sure that people are aware of some of these resources. And that's one of the things we're doing explicitly is making folks aware. And one thing is to kind of be aware of the resources, but another thing to try to figure out how to navigate those systems. Yeah. And so that's what we're also going to walk people through is how to navigate the system. They don't already know how to do that. So yes, that's some, and that's a kind of a missing piece in terms of um, having explicitly resource navigators um, to, to help to steward folks. And so we're, we're advocating for that. So thank you for that question. For your time, another round of applause, please.